Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Welcome, truth seekers, to another lesson in how best to go forth and conquer the digital age. Welcome to Tech Talk with our prophet of the age, Matthew Dickerson. Matt, what distracted you from the lockdown malaise this week? Well, I want to ask a philosophical question, James. I want to actually get our listeners to think about this from a a philosophical point of view. What is technology? Now, some people talk to me and assume that when I'm talking about technology, it's always about electronics. Because lots of the technology we use has obviously got electronics involved, so that makes sense. It's very distracting. Oh, it's very distracting. Actually, let's go back to the caveman. I think when caveman put a rock and a bit of wood together and tied it together with a bit of vine, he had a hammer. That was technology. So I kind of define technology as anything that helps our lives, any sort of tool, any accessory that helps our lives, which often is electronics. But this week, I've actually gotten back into a bit of running. Now, we've talked before about some of the MRIs with my dodgy knee and likes bike riding, doesn't like running so much. Age is a problem. I know. And that's exactly what the orthopedic surgeon said. Reduce the number of birthdays you've had and that might fix your (laughs) knee problem a bit. So thanks very much. Simple solutions, right? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) So I've actually gone and bought some technology shoes and just to use those with a bit of running. Now, I kind of felt like I was cheating a bit. I've seen these shoes. We see them in the Olympics. We see people break the two-hour barrier with a marathon, for example, with these type of shoes. And they've got a carbon plate and they've got special rubber that basically gives you back springiness and all sorts of things. And it all sounded great. And I went, ah, look, I'm not an Olympic runner. I, I, I can't justify that. But I thought, well, if I'm going to do a bit more running and I want to soften the blow on my knee and and actually use these, I'll go and get some. So I got some and they promise, well, they don't promise, the advertising says 4%, they'll improve your speed by 4%. And that's a pretty big claim to go from day one to day two, no change in fitness level, but go 4% faster. Just, Just using a different pair of shoes? Just a different pair of shoes. What about problems for knees? Well, they actually do soften the blow on the knee a bit, so it does actually make your knee feel a bit better, but blow me down. 4% 4% faster. Put on this pair of shoes and oh, I read 4% cheating. faster. And I do feel like I'm cheating. Is there confirmation bias there? Were you expecting to go 4% by, uh, faster and so therefore... <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I've actually gone... I thought you about that. You yourself to that 4%. Part. Well, I've tro- I tried going back and forth. So I tried my normal pair of shoes, ran. Next day I put on the, the super duper pair of shoes and my speed was about 4% faster. And I went, oh, maybe it was exactly... So I, t- I tried harder. So I did it again the next day, about the same pace. Went back to my old shoes and thought, I'm really going to push it today. And I was about 4% slower. So it was quite incredible. And so then I started thinking, well, is this cheating or is this okay? And then I thought, well, hold on, you've got push bikes. I ride a push bike that's carbon fibre and got carbon fibre wheels. And that's certainly better than bikes I used to ride that were old steel clunkers and heavy wheels. And I don't feel like I'm cheating there. And maybe it's because it's available to everyone. Sure, we have... Tour de France riders in the past that have obviously been cheating, but that's been doing things that have been illegal. All the stuff we're talking about here with shoes or bikes, Mm. that's all legal. What's the difference between legal and illegal? I'll leave that to other people to (laughs) to define that. But it's all about taking what we've got in terms of our human body and somehow trying to make it better, whether it be through carbon in our souls or stiffer bikes or swimsuits. Remember years ago, in fact, some of them were ruled illegal in the end, but swimsuits, some of the Olympic swimmers can swim faster because they've got different swimsuits on. So all of that's technology. Well, that's the trick uh, for the Olympic Games Committee, isn't it? Just to find where the line is. But Mm. uh, I guess, yeah, unless you drag everyone back to doing it in the nude, (laughs) like they used to do back in the old days. um, Yeah, uh, I reckon, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, if you've got the right tools, then you're... You give me a mental image now, James. I'm just imagining on the, on the starting the blocks. <laughs> well, I was actually it's difficult to do pole vault without a technology. If you're just going to work with a bit of bamboo, you well, can that's true. And well, that's technology still a bit of bamboo. Yeah, but absolutely. Uh, so it's interesting. So I'd actually say to our listeners, send in your comments, ask at techtalk.digital, and tell us what you think technology is. What's the definition of technology? But I'm absolutely going to stick to these shoes now. I'm not going back. I'm not even going to try experimenting with the old ones anymore. It's forward with the new pair of shoes and just keep replacing. Did you have them. to mortgage your house to get these shoes? <laughs> they weren't too bad. They're a little bit dearer than normal shoes. But I'm talking about. 50 bucks dearer yeah, so yeah. but and again i wasn't sure part of an experiment for tech talk i thought this will be a, a yeah. way to justify what i'm doing here and discussing on tech talk but now that i've done it once that will be forever more no uh, going back <laughs> there you go <laughs> until there's another bit of tech talk. oh yeah absolutely me too If there is one thing we have learned during lockdown, it is that there is video conferencing and then there is video conferencing am i right If you want your video conferences to be remembered for the content of the meeting rather than the substandard quality of the technology, then Crestron is the solution for you. 
Crestron is simple to deploy, simple to use, yet delivers exceptional performance. To improve your next video conference, visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk. Now I'm looking at the running sheet today and I see that there's more bad news for cryptocurrency investors. Bad luck if you're listening to us in China today. A new tech for smartphones that are going to track your mood and Google has a neat idea for international travellers for when travel restrictions lift, of course. But as per usual, we like to dive in with a meaty story about two titans clashing heads. When big business carries essentially the same cloud as an international government, we get some colossal level arm wrestling. It seems that the European Union has decided to take a stance and really crack down on the immense volume of e-waste that is continuously being added to. But it's likely to get some pushback from Apple in one particular case. Matt, what's the EU done to make Apple, or well, the gods at Apple, so cranky? I don't know who's going to win this one, James. Normally you'd think just a country versus a company, the country's going to win. A group of countries, you know, like Europe, for example, versus a company, <laughs> no contest. But this is Apple we're talking about here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they don't just take a little bit of what backlash. What happens when, when an immovable object meets an unstoppable force? That's right, and that's what you've got here. We have talked about it a little bit before because there was a ruling by the European Commission to say, we really want all of you industry guys to get together and just decide on a common standard for your plugs. Mm. And this started way back in 2009, where at the time the European Union or the European Commission said, We've got about 30 different ways when you buy a new piece of electronics to plug it in. Mm. Every different company made their own proprietary plug, and that was the best one, of course. And they Mm. were all probably doing about the same thing. We narrowed it down a bit. We've got micro USB. We've got some USB-A, USB standards. And then it kind of got narrowed down further where USB-C was the standard. Seems to be pretty popular now. It does, yeah. For most companies, that's what they're using. Other than? Exactly right. Other than Apple, who say who you are... the are, lightning gods. They are the lightning gods, and you, you are thwarting innovation, they say, uh. by making us go to USB-C. Lightning is... Well, I'm not sure if they're even saying it's better. Lightning is different to USB-C. Mm. Therefore, we want to stick with lightning. And their argument is really interesting. They say, if you make us go to USB-C for our iPhones then think of all those people out there with lightning connectors. They'll have to throw them out and buy USB-C. Now, you might kind of think there was logic in that argument, apart from the fact that Apple has got USB-C with their iPad Pro range, mm. their iPad Air range, their new iPad Mini they just announced recently. They're all using USB-C. So if it was so important to stick with lightning, why wouldn't they have stuck with lightning with those particular devices? Yeah. At the moment, the only devices they've got left with lightning are their iPhones and even the new iPhone 13 and the iPad, the standard iPad, if you like, the iPad 10.2. So they're still using lightning. Everything else in the range from Apple has got USB-C. Their MacBooks have got USB-C ports on them. So you kind of think, oh, what's the go yeah. here? What? Why are they so focused on it? Part of it might be they make a little bit, and I'm talking about a little bit, of money every time someone manufactures a device with lightning ports on it. So if you buy a charger or a desktop stand, any other device that's got a lightning port, Apple picks up their little bit of lightning commission because it's their registered device, so you have to pay them a little bit. But I would have thought when you're a $2 trillion company, the amount of commission that you Mm. make out of that part alone would be minimal, would be an absolute drop in the ocean. So whether or not it's just because they like to be in control, which Apple do. And that's what I think this is. This is just about control. Probably. When when you're a $2.4 trillion company... (laughs) You've got control, right? That's right. And you're telling me I don't have control? That you want me to change my plugs? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so you're probably right. It probably just comes down to that. But it is interesting. I think the only logical way for them to go will be have to change to USB-C. Whether they get to the stage next year with their new iPhone where they just say, stuff for lot of years, oh, we're going to go portless altogether. So you want us to get USB-C, we're not going to even do that. We might just go no port on the phone. And obviously they do wireless charging now. Less. E-waste, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, maybe, but then you'd have to have a wireless charger, yeah. which we've got now. That's yeah. fine. But then, of course, you've got the Apple proprietary wireless charger called MagSafe, which only works or the MagSafe option gives extra charge to an iPhone. But then they might say to transfer data, for example, from an iPhone to something you want to plug it into. When you might plug it into a lightning port now, you might have to use a proprietary wireless device, which would then create more e-waste because you're going yeah, to have, right. have more products there. That may be the way they go. That may be the future. And let's think about it. It would probably make it easier to keep all of it waterproof, which they are rated IP68 now, so they are water resistant. 
it would make it even easier if you didn't have to have a charging port there and it was completely wireless. There was only the microphone and the speaker to worry about in terms of any ingress of water. So that might be a, an option going forward. I don't know. It just it makes so much sense to go USB-C. The European Commission says it makes sense to go USB-C. Every other manufacturer says it makes sense to go USB-C. But Apple. <laughs> Apple said, no. <laughs> this reminds me of the story of Zeus and the dishing out a punishment to Atlas, you know. Yeah. Google that story. Uh, I wonder if Atlas is going to just take the punishment, though. He's just going to I don't know. ditch I, carrying the, the I, planet on his shoulders I, and just say, no, bug you. I, I'm not convinced. I'm not, I'm not convinced either way, actually. Speaking of governments and business tussling, China has just stepped into the ring with anyone who wants to peddle their particular brand of cryptocurrency. They've officially outlawed cryptocurrency trading. Is that right, Matt? Have I got my facts right on that? They've outlawed everything to do with cryptocurrencies. And it's one of those things, the greatest strength of cryptocurrencies, the thing that people always talk about is no one's in control, no central government, no central bank. That's what we love about cryptocurrency. But the greatest strength is also the greatest weakness. When you've got no one in control, when you've got no one that says we regulate things, then you get sometimes bad things happen. But then you sometimes get a government that says, well, we don't recognize that currency because mm. we're not offending another trading partner. We're not going to say we don't recognize the Australian dollar, so that's it for all transactions with Australia. We just don't recognize cryptocurrency, so bad luck for a lot of you. Now, they've actually outlawed it in the past. They've said we don't support cryptocurrencies, but they've allowed some foreign exchanges to keep trading in the boundaries of China. But they've now got to the point where they're saying we're cracking down. We're not allowing any trading, we're not allowing anyone to have any transactions at all on cryptocurrencies, and we're not allowing mining. Now, mining of cryptocurrencies was big in China because you had cheap power. And one of the things you need with crypto mining, we've talked about it before, people sometimes steal power yeah. so they can mine <laughs> cryptocurrency because it costs you more electricity to mine the cryptocurrency than the cryptocurrency is worth. If you get the power for free, if you steal it, or if you get it cheaply, for example, in China, you might say, oh, it's still worth mining cryptocurrencies. But they actually outlawed that altogether now. So that's interesting. Now, cryptocurrencies, obviously Bitcoin is the biggest one of those. Bitcoin dropped US $2,000 on the news of this announcement alone. So I've got a big question here. You've got a whole lot of, well, Chinese businessmen who have got a load of cryptocurrency and they've just been told, sorry, that's valueless. There's nothing you can do about that now and unless you leave our shores. Well, and I think that's it. If the Chinese government says something's illegal and you can't do it anymore... Well, I reckon I'd probably do it because yeah. <laughs> they're a bit scary sometimes. Yeah. And no offence to any Chinese people out there, but sometimes when the Chinese government speaks, then people have to listen. That's Otherwise, right. there are consequences. So you're right. If you're a cryptocurrency advocate in China and you've got a few dollars tucked away in cryptocurrency, This is more than just the mum and dads. This is, this is the people who've got lots of money. Yeah, that's right. And it's in cryptocurrency. So I think you're right. I think leave the shores, cash it all in, and then get out of it. But wow. there have been some unbelievable scams, and I thought it'd be worthwhile just touching on a couple of the ones that I looked at because we've talked about some of them in general terms in the past, but this is the problem. This is where I think the Chinese government's concerned. They're concerned about their lack of control for a start, but also yeah. their citizens and what might happen. And one of the scams I found... Hang on a second. I, I just feel like this is going to be a ha-ha-ha, told you so sort of thing. I'm <laughs> well, for this. Yeah. <laughs> well not, not necessarily. I suppose there's nothing inherently wrong with a cryptocurrency in terms of being a scam, but because people don't understand it, and because it's so complicated, it makes it easier to scam people. And there was one, there was Dr. Ruja Ignatova, and she sounded impressive. She had a degree, a doctorate. She was a doctor of philosophy. She was out there spouting her new cryptocurrency. She had this one called OneCoin. It was going to make Bitcoin be forgotten about. It was going to be so big. And she toured the world, talked about this. People invested, and they haven't been able to find out exactly how much, but anywhere between 4 billion euro and maybe up to 15 billion euro. Oh, what? And then one day she was meant to talk at a conference and she didn't turn up. And they were a bit concerned and they made some day. phone calls. and Yeah, she was we really know well known for being absolutely on time. And so not turning up on time for a conference to speak at a conference was unusual. But surprise, surprise, they couldn't find her. And they haven't been able to find her since. And that was a couple of years ago. So somewhere in the world, there is this person with up to 15 billion euro. On a luxury yacht. Oh, absolutely. Off owning, the coast of Dubai. Only a fleet of luxury yachts. <laughs> and I reckon with 15 billion euro in your back pocket, you could probably change your identity. I reckon that'd be enough to pay someone to make you disappear and someone new appear. James Eddy version two, maybe. So that's what's happening with that one. And again, it's not cryptocurrency that was bad. But in that particular example, she did not have a cryptocurrency. 
One coin did not exist. There was no blockchain. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. She <laughs> said to people, invest. This is going to be fantastic. They were paying money, and she was giving them a website that looked like their investment was growing because, hey, cryptocurrencies must grow. So it was growing away happily, but it was just a website. There was nothing behind it. And that's the problem you've got. With any cryptocurrency. Well, you understand, you go and grab someone that invests in cryptocurrency and say, just show me where your money is. And maybe you could say the same argument for a central bank, but you've got a government that backs a central bank, so you maybe have mm. maybe a little bit more faith, maybe not sometimes, but there are a couple of quick ones. BitConnect was another one that actually was a cryptocurrency, but there were losses of around $3.5 billion for investors in that one. And again, there were some alarm bells that should have been ringing. When people were advertising BitConnect, they said, invest in BitConnect, this is a new cryptocurrency, it will gain 1% compound interest per day after your investment. Now, if anyone says that they're going to gain 1% per day compounding, <laughs> you've probably got to say, is it, how? Is this too good to be true? That's a logical question, James. That's too logical. So $3.5 billion oh. was invested based on 1% per day. And surprisingly enough, it collapsed and it was found to be a Ponzi scheme. No surprise there. Uh, Thodex was, <laughs> I actually like this one. I don't really like it because it was people obviously stealing money, but they tricked investors into placing $2.2 billion into this fake exchange. But what happened was you were told, invest your cryptocurrency in this one, so transfer your cryptocurrency to me. And in return, I'll give you some of the, and I know we've talked about the pronunciation, doggy coin or Dogecoin. Yeah. You'll get some doggy coin in return. People went, okay, and you would double it. You would double, so you give me one unit of your cryptocurrency, I'll give you double that number of units back. And because cryptocurrencies can't be traced mm. when you transfer that money, money was transferred in, oh, what a surprise. You got no money in return, no doggy <laughs> coin in return, nothing back in return. And then, hold on, where'd my money go? I'll chase it down. Oh, what if I can't chase it down? I don't know who got it. Where's it gone? It's so $2.2 billion was done in that sort of format. Ah. Um, Kaspersky, which is a security firm, I'm, I'm quite familiar with Kaspersky. I've done a bit of work with them over the years. They said there's more than 1,500 scams in the first half of this year alone that were based on cryptocurrency scams. So I'm not saying cryptocurrency is bad, James. I'm just saying there are a lot of scams that seem to be associated with cryptocurrencies because it's so complicated and because people don't understand it. It just seems like a bag full of magic beans. People keep giving their hard-earned, selling their milking cows for a bunch of magic beans <laughs> in the hopes that they're going to get this beanstalk that's going to take them to greater riches up in the cloud somewhere. I just... Hmm. I like your example you've used before with the Emperor's New Clothes, yeah. <laughs> where it is everyone saying, get onto this, James, because can't you see? You must be stupid if you can't see how good cryptocurrencies are. You must be an idiot, just like the Emperor's New Clothes. Hmm. And, of course, people buy their cryptocurrencies, and do they get it back? I had one guy who actually was quite legitimately buying some cryptocurrencies, but he told me he was convinced they were real. I think they were, he did actually have some Bitcoin, but he just couldn't get rid of it. He didn't, couldn't work how to cash it in. It had gone up in value, supposedly, but he couldn't work out how to cash it in. And that's the other challenge. You've got to be able to work out a way yeah. to trade these cryptocurrencies. It's not as easy as just going to your local bank or getting on the stock exchange, the local stock exchange. There's a complicated process. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe yeah, yeah. 1837, Hans Christian Anderson had it right with the Emperor's <laughs> New Clothes. And I live my life with fables and um, <laughs> children's <laughs> stories, uh, and the lessons that they teach us. Moving on to something less financially devastating and, well, quite frankly, hilarious. I love this story, Matt. This has uh, had me literally wiping the tears from my eyes. I was laughing so hard. It's a slice of absolute gold, folks. And I'm just going to let Matt tell it from the start. Well, in New Zealand, as they do in many places around the world, local council meetings are put online. You want to keep in touch with your local democracy. You want to see what's happening. Then you go online and you have a look at that. But you kind of need a vested interest to go online and you have a want look to, at it, don't you? You want to be pretty focused on it. You want to have right. something that involves you or there's some decision that might impact your local community. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty excited at a local council meeting if they have maybe 100 views because that mm. means, wow, 100 people in our community were interested in Talking what happened. something the, very interesting there, <laughs> that's right? right? That must be a really, really hot topic they're discussing there. One council in New Zealand, the Wiper District Council, had 290,000 views <laughs> on one of their meetings. And it wasn't even their council meeting. It was just a committee meeting. It was their finance committee meeting. And you think, wow, I don't know how many people are in Wiper, but there's not 290,000. So everyone in Wiper supposedly viewed this council meeting more than once, <laughs> multiple <laughs> times, multiple times, Check over and over. Check the comments section. Check the comments section. <laughs> and then a bit more investigation found that Actually, it was being viewed by people all over the world. Not by people in Wiper, but people all over the world. They're talking about stuff that interesting. It was so interesting. And then further investigation found that actually people were just putting it on, playing in the background, because it was a perfect meeting to trick your 
boss, your parents, whoever, into thinking that you were working really hard. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fantastic. <laughs> so there were some comments there. One guy said, I've played this at least 10 times because it just sits there in the background. Anyone that walks into my room yeah. apologises. You point your ears, you point to the screen. That's right. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't realise you were in a meeting and they walk out again. Uh, one guy said that he got caught by his wife saying, hold on, that sounds like a foreign accent. Oh, it's an international meeting I'm in at the moment. So yeah. he was in this the, is a big deal. That's right. He was in the US and there was these New Zealand <laughs> accents coming through. So, so kids are putting comments on there saying that they just get in there and play games on their phone while they play that in their computer and let their parents walk past and, oh, well done, son, you're working your way hard there. So I couldn't have predicted this in terms of a way an online meeting would be used in some way, shape or form. It's I, just I one think of those it's random absolutely things. masterful. And it's another great thing to come out of uh, from our Kiwi cousins. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, look, I, I thank them for Taika Waititi. I, I thank them for the Hunt for the Wilder People, the, the Flight of the Concords, Reese Darby, and now this... I love New Zealand. I love them all. <laughs> so if anyone wants to know, it's a one hour 44 meeting. So if you've got one hour 44 that you need to burn up or trick some people into it, it's a good meeting. And then, of course, you can play it over and over and people will just leave you alone. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, I think that's fantastic. Time to come back down to earth with some more serious business. Uh, new South Wales Police developed a new plan using tech to assist them to locate missing people. It involves sending emergency alerts to phones in a particular area, but there's been a backlash And we need to get back to square one now. The really disappointing part about this is that the technology involved in this was brilliant. They got together, the three major carriers in Australia, Optus, Telstra, Vodafone, slash TPG. Mm. And they said, we want to be able to target someone, geo-target someone, or everyone, sorry, in an area where there's been a missing person, where there's been an incident. We want the community's help. And the best way to do it is to say, all the people that were in this area at this time, get a text message on their phone. So the technology there, I went, wow, that's Mm. really impressive technology. And to get the three different carriers together and combine their mighty forces and give that information to the public, what a great thing for the community. And it's got to be done, like for missing people, it's got to be done quickly. Well, well, I think about these cop shows in America where they they interview someone weeks later and say, hey, did you ever see this person walk in your shop or whatever? And if, if that question was asked to me... Yeah, I might have seen them. <laughs> you know, right. I've got no idea. And, you know, put me up, gun to my head, and now I'm still probably going to go um and R and, and whatnot. But You've got more important things to think about than a person you saw it's at all a about shop your randomly. Yeah. That's right. If you can say to someone, did you see someone an hour ago compared to two weeks ago? Absolutely. Mm. There's a big difference there. So getting this information out there, and if you got the information out there quick enough, it may well be that this person's still walking around. It might be someone with dementia, for example. They're a bit lost. And someone might say, actually... I, I did see someone just a minute ago. I might just duck back up the road and see if they're still there. So that immediacy is really important. So absolutely fantastic. Well done to the police. Well done to the carriers. But mm. the problem is we've been told for how long now? Don't trust those text messages that come in, especially that have got a link in them. They're obviously a scam, and there are so many scams. We've talked about them before. Flubot's the most famous one that we've yeah. talked about before. So all these messages come in, and we're learning to ignore them. If it's not from someone that we know, ignore that text message because it's obviously a scam. The problem with this one from the police is they are putting a link in there. They say, please click on this link, and you can see a picture of the person we're looking for. Mm. Oh, well, that must be okay. It's from the police. I'll click on that link. Oh, hold on, that wasn't a picture. That was something that infected my phone with a virus. Yeah, and this is wrecked because of naughty, bad people. Absolutely. Now, a little bit of naivety from the police. They actually said, oh, it's okay. You know it's from us because every phone message that we send out comes from the number 444-444-444. And I just I felt like ringing the guy that actually made that comment saying, do you know how easy it is to spoof a number? Mm. I play around with it with friends of mine where I'll spoof a number where they've made it look like they've sent themselves a message. So they'll get a message on their phone <laughs> and they'll go, hold on, James Eddy just sent a message to James Eddy. How did that happen there? So you can have all sorts of fun with spoofing messages. You can do it for fun. You can do it for cynical reasons or you can do it because you're a scammer. But when they said that, when they made that announcement, I went, oh no, every scam we see from now on is going to come from the number mm. 444 It's just so easy to spoof that number. I think the secret here here is what the police have got to do is they've got to say, we think there's someone in this area. Send the message out still, no problems at all. Please go to your local police. Please go to a local website. Please go to a local Facebook page. Yeah. Have something there that's not a link in the message. So if someone's interested enough, they can say, I'll go and have a look for that person. But as soon as you put that link in there, and there were comments on one of the stories I read about this where people just said, oh, I've seen one of those messages. 
I deleted it immediately because I assumed yeah. it was some scam that was going on. And you're right, because of people doing the wrong thing, this is something that would be really positive. This is something that we could actually get really good results from, except there's some idiots out there who want to take advantage of everything we've got. Yeah, and put that one in the file for great ideas. It would have been good if everyone was nice and played by the rules, I guess. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure if there'll be some solution. Maybe there's some cyber experts working on some sort of solution now to make it legitimate in some way, shape or form. I can't think of one at the moment. But again, you do that, then there's probably going to be scammers who will work out a way around that. Mm. And just to give you that bit of information, Scamwatch said that already they're receiving this year 5,000 complaints of phishing scams every month, and about 52.6 million has been lost in scams, online scams, this year alone. So it's big business for those scammers, and if they can see another way to make themselves look legitimate, they'll be all over it. Yeah. I guess back to photos on milk cartons or whatever. For, yeah, I mean, that's a good idea, actually. I like that one. <laughs> the world has changed dramatically over the last 18 months, and the new normal will involve a hybrid workforce with video conferencing a part of that mix. You need your staff to focus on what really matters, the meeting, not the technology. Crestron can help your Teams or Zoom or WebEx meeting rooms work first time, every time, because Crestron is all about you. It is simple to deploy, simple to manage, and a joy to use. To use video conferencing that adapts to the way you want to work, visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk. I'm worried about this next story. Are you going all hippie on me? Smartphones already tracking all sorts of data stuff on it, like the step counts, heart rates, etc. Now you're going to tell me that an iPhone has a mood app to register how I'm feeling? This is some hippie stuff here. Is this the 21st century tech meeting 1965 cultural headspace? Oh, man. I was actually thinking that it was more like those mood rings. When you... Yeah, that's what I thought as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like to talk about the Phantom comics and the things we can buy from there, the x-ray glasses, but the mood rings were the classic, weren't mm, they? You'd put yeah. them on and change you'd look at the... Colour. That's right, the colour would change. And, oh, no, I'm in this mood now. Or maybe the moon's alive with Venus or something. <laughs> who knows? But this is actually something that they're trying to take a whole range of indicators and feed them into some sort of algorithm that will pick up our mood. They're working with some universities, as you can imagine. UCLA is the main one they're working with to try and work out the different things people might do. And so then you start to think about it. You go, well, how's my phone going to pick up my mood? Is it going to pick up the but tone of my why voice? Why does that want to pick up my mood? Well, I suppose it's part of the whole mental health progress around the world to start to look out for people that okay. are potentially going to maybe do harm to themselves or be in a, a headspace that might be right. We still lose way too many people to suicide in this mm. country alone. I don't know numbers for around the rest of the world, but we lose thousands every year to suicide. And for many of those people, they're the younger part of our generation that have got so much potential opportunity in front of them. So maybe part of the message here is that if we can pick up some of those moods and warn people about their moods before they realise they're in a really dark space, maybe they'll take some action about mm. it. Maybe not. Maybe part of it is we really see a big focus on health at the moment and we talked about things like diabetes and ECGs and heart rates, all those things that wearables can detect. Maybe they're just saying, what's the next thing we can try and detect? Maybe it is moods. But I started to think about how would a phone know? What would it pick up on? What were the indicators? And I came up with a few random vague things that it might be able to pick up on. But what Apple is working on are a range of things. For example, when you're typing messages, how fast do you type? How many mistakes you make? They're picking up some of that and trying yeah, to build right. algorithms on that. So if you're angry, mad, depressed, whatever, you might start to change the way you're typing, just how quick you're typing, maybe how hard you're pushing on the actual phone when you're typing, the mistakes you make. Gee, some of the, the text messages I can see come through, they've got so many mistakes and people must be in a terrible mood. I'm not <laughs> sure, but maybe they just can't spell properly. But all those sort of things. But then your phone also listens to you when you're talking on the phone. It may pick up different tonalities of your voice for example it might pick up the different speech pattern you might be talking very fast or you might be talking very slow or the tone of your voice and it also sees your picture on a regular basis it sees your face because you might be doing a facetime call you might have a, a facial camera so if you can build all of that into something you know you might walk in and see a friend and you go g'day jimmy you don't look on top just, of it today there's yeah, just something that looks a bit a off bit about off. you how do you know that you're without realizing it, you're taking a bunch of sensory inputs from this person and put it together and say, he just doesn't seem right. There's something wrong. Mm. A phone obviously has to have that algorithm built in. You can't just say to a phone, just work it out. Eventually, you might be able to say to a phone, just work it out, but you need to give it some indication. And that's where Apple's working on with all of this to try and give some indication of mood. The main concern from psychologists with this has been you don't want to get 
a false positive. So you don't want your wow. phone saying, James, I think you're in a bad space at the moment. Are you okay? And well, then you go. Nothing to get you wound up like someone telling you to calm down. Well, it might be like that. Oh, I didn't think I was in a bad mood, but well, now you mentioned it. Oh, now it keeps telling me. Yeah, yeah. I, I am feeling terrible actually. Now that you, oh, this is it. My my life's worthless. What am I going to do about it? So that's probably the biggest risk for this from a psychologist's point of view. Having some indication that something might be wrong is a great idea, mm. but going too far and warning you about something that isn't actually happening—that's where there's some concern from psychologists. Who knows what it will look like? I suspect it'll be. My my estimation would be two years away before we see something like this, but I think we'll see it. I think there's no doubt about it that we will see some way of our technology talking about our mood and giving us some indication of our mood. We'll throw away our mood rings now. Oh, no, no. no. Got we'll go that far. No, no, no. <laughs> we need that, that colour indicator as well. Yeah, okay. Obviously, the secret would be a Bluetooth mood ring that connects to your ah. phone, so it would actually give you <laughs> some real indication rather than being fake, which I assume the mood rings are. <laughs> right. At the UN, delegates wear headphones and they're fed translations from an interpreter. Well, the people at Google felt that it's time to get our earbuds to do that for themselves and cut out the middleman. It was like the, the Babel fish in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy for fans of Douglas Adams. Matt, how is this going to work? <laughs> it is great, actually. And I do like Douglas Adams and I love the idea of I the Babel him. fish. I think the Babel fish used to, you put it in your ear and it would eat one language and it would excrement out a different language <laughs> that was your own local language. I think that was the concept for the Babel fish, which doesn't sound that pleasant in your ear, but it worked when you travelled around the galaxy. This is just a new set of buds from Google. So it wasn't so much they were building buds to be an automatic translator. It just so happens that this is the way people are using them because your phone can actually translate languages. You You've got lots of different apps, and I've used them overseas, lots of different apps that will allow you to translate language from one language to another. You speak in one language, and it helps you by giving it back to you in a different language. By actually taking an earbud and putting it in someone's ear and having a phone that you sit between the two of you, you could actually speak in a language, and you could just have it automatically translate. There are apps that will do that into another language. So the idea here, it's almost as if you're learning a language. If you said, hey, I want to learn a new language, put some earbuds in, everything I say, repeat back to me in a different language. Do that, but have another person with that earbud in, suddenly you've got a translation device. Not designed for that, not built for that, but it works in that way. And working in real time, Working in real time. Now, it's not too bad. I've actually done some of these translations, and there's not much of a delay. It's actually taking that information. It's not processing it on the phone. So the biggest part of the delay is actually transmitting it out to a server somewhere and then bringing it back. But that doesn't create much of a delay. So you can actually have a translation. And what I like about it in particular, I've been to various countries overseas. I've actually being here in Australia with translators, with real life human translators. And what always worries me is two things happen. One, I'll say a sentence that might be 20 or 30 seconds long. And the human translator, then giving it to the audience, says two words. Mm. And I go, hold on. I said a lot more than that. <laughs> and what I said was really important. And it's just gone two words. All these reverse happen sometimes. I'll say three or four words. And the translation and on is... And on and on and on. And I'm thinking, are they saying this guy looks funny? And They're embellishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, right. And then everyone laugh at the point where I nod my head. So with a human translator, you're not 100% sure whether they're getting it right. One of the great things about using these type of translators is when you speak your language, not only does it translate into the other language, but it shows you on screen what it interpreted your voice as. Mm. So in other words, if you said a few words in English and it got some wrong, you would see it on screen and then you could quickly correct yourself and say, uh-huh. oh, oh, I'll do that again. Yeah. It thought I said this, but I meant to say that. So you can say it again. So you can see that it's getting your part right. You can't see the translations right because obviously you can't speak the other language, but you hope that it's getting it somewhat right. So not completely glitch-free at this stage, but still very, very practical. Oh, at least it's, it's very going to cut down on the amount of charades that has to be played uh, while you're trying to buy something from a fish market in Well, I, I have used them overseas. I've used these apps, not with earbuds in, but just on a phone, where I've actually spoken into it at a restaurant, in a taxi, those sort of things where you, you must get it absolutely right because yeah. you want to make sure that what you're ordering is exactly what you're going to get. Or you end up where you're supposed <laughs> to get it to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they do work in those scenarios. And again, I've always relied on when I speak, I look look at my phone. Yes, it says the words that I think I said, so let the translation go through. And it also puts it on screen, written on screen, in the other language, so the person can actually read it if they're not sure if they didn't hear it properly because of it being generated by a computer. But this sort of real-time translation, forget learning another language, James. Just rely on our technology. Google Translate. Yeah. Well, um, I guess uh, the days of me pretending that I can't speak English um, are limited now. <laughs> so when they're telling me to please stop what I'm doing and get out of their front garden, I can't just point to my ears and shake my head. And no, not anymore, right. sorry. Okay, right. <laughs> 
GMOs, folks, genetically modified organisms. A little acronym there that really stirs some people and gets blood boiling, but it also, well, it's potentially an answer to a lot of the world's problems for feeding such a large population. 7.5 billion, I think we're up to or close to these days. Well, a new tomato is about to hit the shelves of Japan. And the question is, is it GMO or isn't it? And so we sort of have to talk about uh, a bit about definitions. Tell us about this tomato, Matt. Well, this tomato is actually using CRISPR. And I actually get a bit excited by CRISPR because I think we'll see tomatoes today Tomorrow, humans. Now, mm. maybe tomorrow is a bit further than just tomorrow. It might be several decades down the track. But the awesome thing about CRISPR is you can zoom in on a particular gene, say, I want to modify the gene and I want to modify it in this way. Yeah. And so genes are just A's, T's, G's, and C's. Adamine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Four chemicals there that we need to just change the order of in the sequence of DNA. Anyway, sorry, I've taken the way. No, no, that's, that's perfect. I was going to say the same thing, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing that is exciting about CRISPR. We'll have people with some sort of genetic problem. It might be heart disease. It might be cystic fibrosis. There might be some sort of genetic modification. And we'll be able to go in and, as you say, cut bits out or yeah, add bits in. bits. Zeroing yeah. in on specific bits of your genome yeah. and being able to modify those specific bits. Yeah. So that's exciting. But in the meantime... Before we're there, there's obviously going to be a whole bunch of other stuff done with CRISPR. And this first thing that we're seeing here is that the first tomatoes across the world, in fact, the first plants of any description, they're now going to be sold that are being modified or have been modified by CRISPR. So these tomatoes are adding in, effectively, you're getting more GABA. And you'll tell me what GABA stands for because I, I, I struggle with this pronunciation. So. Yeah, it's, it's pronounced gamma amino butyric acid. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so basically they're taking a tomato and making it better for us. So that's great. We've seen sometimes in the past where we've actually done some GMO. As you said, you've had some people who are a little bit focused. Oh, people on... get very, very finicky about this because they don't like the idea of their food being tampered. They want it grown naturally. Mm. But so much of the food that is on our shelves now, I understand, has had some degree of genetic modification. Well, if you want to talk about it, I guess agriculture over the last 2,000 years has been us tweaking with the, the genome of, of those organisms, be it goats, be it wheat, be it corn, be it any sort of product that we've been growing agriculturally. We've been selecting parents for those products and getting better and better yields as a result. And so GMOs are often about increasing yield and increasing shelf life. And that's the thing, isn't it? We have been doing it for thousands of years, but we may not have been doing it through a scientific process. It's probably still a basic scientific process. Let's take those better yielding products and keep using those more. Yeah. But when you start getting bits of other types of products and add them in. Yeah, so, things that aren't related. Yeah, that's yeah. when I think people get really stirred up about it. But it doesn't matter. Does it? When you when you go and add those bits in, you're not eating that other particular type of product. You're still eating the main product. Well, I hesitate. To, yeah, don't quote me on this, folks, but I understand that there was a tomato that we cut a toad gene out using recombinant DNA, and we cut a toad gene out uh, from a toad that, that grew in uh, very, very cold conditions, actually went into hibernation in cold conditions. We are able to take the gene that enabled it to survive those cold conditions, and we plugged it into tomato. Now we could grow these tomatoes in super cold climates, which is a big advantage. And see, that to me is... Wonderful. That's but fantastic. people don't like, they felt like they were eating toads. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Of course. Uh, and... uh, look, toads okay, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, you're still eating a tomato. Now, in this scenario here, and this is in Japan, this particular tomato, which has been edited by CRISPR, the regulators are saying that this doesn't need to come under the rules of genetically modified crops because... They're not genetically modifying them? And this is where I get a bit confused. Yeah, look, I think if you're changing the genes, then you're modifying the genes. However, genetically, genetically. there's a technical thing. They're just tampering with the genes that are already there. So I think that's the technical aspect they're taking. They're not actually adding other bits. They're not adding another type of plant or another mm. toad into the tomato plant. They're just cutting out or adding or removing or changing the gene, mm. they're not taking it from something well, else. Well, when we're teaching this in, in a biology class, we talk about a deletion, which is where we cut a bit of a gene out, or we might talk about an inversion where we flip a gene over, or a duplication where we take a gene and then make it happen once or twice in that genome. It's generally the addition or the substitution that people get the heebie-jeebies with. And so I, I think that's a technicality that they're getting away with. Yeah, and it's Japan. not the same everywhere. So Japan has said, that's okay. These aren't genetically modified. In the US, it's the same. The US Department of Agriculture has said that, no, this particular Sicilian Rouge high GABA tomato won't be regulated under the same rules for genetically modified crops. 
But in the UK and the European Union, the tomato would currently be regulated as genetically modified, which means that really to get approvals for it under those rules, they probably won't sell them there until, who knows, they change the laws and then this won't be classified as genetically modified. Overall, I just think it's exciting that we're getting to the point where now we're not taking some other bits and adding them in. We're actually just going and modifying that Mm. DNA itself. And that's the really exciting part, I think. So tomatoes today, some other plants tomorrow, you and I next week. (laughs) (laughs) Six million dollar man, eat your heart out. That's right. When 3D printing first came out, it was pretty cool. I remember being impressed by taking something that was effectively an image on a computer and, and creating a 3D model. It was, it was really effectively just an ornament made out of plastic. But the ideas people started working out where they could solve problems and we started printing parts of machines, tools, prosthetics for people, and the sky became the limit. Now the US Army is looking to print, wait for it, folks, concrete buildings and bridges. Matt, I am blown away by this. And the thing is with an army, they want to be able to do it quickly. They want to be able to get in there and knock it over and get it up. So it may not be perfect, but they want to be able to roll it out quickly and roll it out in all sorts of areas. So they might want to Mm. build some buildings in maybe a barracks, for example. They might need some personnel house somewhere. Bridges, absolutely. And And often in difficult terrain. Yeah, that's right. And just forget about being in wartime. One thing that we can use the army for, we're seeing it with rollout of vaccines across Australia at the moment, you can use yeah. army personnel, you can use... Catastrophes like earthquakes, floods. All those things. And I remember many years ago in central West New South Wales, in Wellington, there was a bridge that was knocked down by a truck that went over and caught one of the girders. And the army came in and built a flotation bridge. Now, they did that quickly, in inverted commas. It took them several months to do it, but it allowed another crossing of the river where the mm. main bridge had been knocked down. That had limitations on what it could do and all the rest of it. But this particular example where you could 3D print something, that would have been perfect all those years ago in Wellington. You could actually go and 3D print a bridge, make it done quickly, (laughs) get it done so you could get people out of trouble, if you like, in a very short period of time and keep going. So exactly, as you say, a disaster, an earthquake, any sort of disaster that might happen in the community, you could bring the army in and say, quick, 3D print whatever we might need. Imagine going into somewhere where a tsunami had hit and 3D printing some houses And to make it portable, as with so many things, they build all this into a container. So the Mm. army's focusing on this whole lot of technology. And we've talked about 3D printing a house before, but the whole structure of that is fairly large. This is taking something that's a container size. So you can put it on the back of a truck, put it on a ship, put it on some sort of carrier quite easily, get it to where it needs to go, and then unpack it and roll it out. And so they're building these 3D printing devices in containers and then rolling them out so they can build things quickly. And you're talking about days, you're talking about uh, build a barracks, for example, an army barracks within days, not weeks or months. You're talking about days to roll these things out. Well, and not only that, but um, transporting the raw materials as well. Often when you need to build stuff, there's wasted materials in, in packaging, in, in airspace for your, for your carrying and whatnot. So if things don't pack neatly. But what we're looking at here is raw materials, which can pack very, very, very tightly with, with next to no space wastage at all. Um, and the printer itself. That's right. And what they're also doing is working on being able to take some local raw materials. So if they Mm. can't always transport all of that, so concrete's an obvious one. When we've looked at 3D printing with concrete before, the concrete's been specially formulated to go through the 3D printer. What the Army's saying is there might be examples where we might have some local supplies of concrete, for example. We just need to get the 3D printer in there and to supply all the materials at the same time might be problematic if we could just use those local materials. So they're trying to work on building this, or they are building it, so we'll actually be able to work with local materials as well as ones they might transport with them. And that's a real challenge for them. Well, uh, I just reckon 3D printing is amazing, (laughs) absolutely amazing. They're talking about 3D printing food when we do long-distance space travel. So you'll be able to have your fresh apple, you'll be able to have your sausage roll or whatever. You just need the proteins and uh, the raw materials that go into that, and you can print that food. That's still pie in the sky, folks. I get that. I look forward to hearing more about 3D printing. Well, the logic is a bit like things we talked about before with lab meat, isn't it? Everything's made up of atoms. If we can just put those atoms... Arrange those in, atoms like that. Right. Well, it, like it, it sounds simple. It's just arrange those atoms in the right way. <laughs> Take the right atoms and put them in the right way. And there you've got whatever you want. And that's what we've got around society. So getting 3D printing to that point where it can arrange the atoms in the way we want, as you say, an apple, if you want, or yep. a building or a bridge. Without within. the seeds. I don't want the seeds. <laughs> well, of course. Why would you put them? If you're going to 3D print them, why waste your time printing those seeds? Facebook is in the headlines again. 
as legislation tries to keep up with the internet like an overweight middle-aged man chasing a train down the tracks as after it's already left the station. You know what I mean, folks. Now, the legal beagles are looking to pull up some community pages over permitting certain comments to flow pretty freely. Matt, some murky waters ahead here, aren't there? I think the biggest risk here, James, is that we are losing community pages because of this. The mm. community pages, especially over the last 18 months, have been invaluable, keeping people in touch, making sure people can stay connected. And they're really important, I think. But it's even simple things. The mountain bike club that I race with, I check on there to see when the mountain bike season's starting as we come Mm. out of lockdown and where are we racing at. It's just simple things like that. But now the High Court had a ruling that said that if you're running a Facebook page, you're liable for what some other idiot says on your page. So someone gets on there, rants off, throws a whole bunch of rubbish over all sorts of people. Sure, someone might come along and say, I don't like what you said about me. I'm going to sue you because you wrote those comments. But hold on, you're the hoster of this page. I'm going to sue you as well. So you let it, you've let it run. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's okay. worse than that. Even with moderation, it depends how long it's up there for. The court may rule there was damage done, even if it was up there for a certain amount of time. And with these community pages, they don't have full-time people moderating them. No. It's often someone comes home from work and they just jump on Facebook and an hour later they, they'll get around and looking at that. And that comment might have been up there for a day or might have been longer than that. The real issue here is that I think the High Court was thinking of large media organisations that are mm. out there with part of their news service using Facebook, for example, and they've got teams of solicitors and insurances in place and teams of moderators. So for them, it's probably a bit easy to keep all those things under control. But for the good old-fashioned community page, or think about a small business that's got a page up, they might just have some simple things there where they're putting a new product up and then someone makes a comment about that product. Suddenly that company thinks that their company has been defamed. So suddenly you've got this company suing this little small Bang. business. Yeah, there it is. So it is an issue. We've seen already some people that have taken notice of this and actually changed what they're doing. So the Tasmanian Premier has closed down his Facebook page. The ACT Chief Minister... Wow close down the Facebook page. And those things, I think, are really important to be able to keep people connected and that communication coming. People feel like they're connected when they can can touch base with someone in that format. Absolutely right. Now, they could remove all comments from these pages, but one of the things that's really important is, say, for example, the Premier of a state, having people be able to comment on things so you get an idea of whether the things that you're doing are hitting the right chord with the community. But Removing comments is one level, but some people have, as I said, just taken the move to remove those pages altogether. So this is, I think, a really disappointing part of it. Yes, there are some idiots out there. They say some stupid things on social media. They say things they would never say to your face. Mm. That's all bad. But we still like the idea that these community pages are out there to help us stay connected and in touch. Goodness me. Well... There's a tool that, uh, yeah, we might just fall by the wayside, unfortunately. Yeah, I think we need probably either legislation, as you said, that's a real challenge, or maybe there will need to be some sort of other precedent with some of these community pages to see what happens with them. But I think the legislators just need to get all over this because it's it'll take too long to get back to where we are now with that great community engagement. Well, with all things technology, legislation's just that couple of metres behind um, the, the technology. Back in the old days before COVID-19, organising a meeting was easy. You bought a few coffees and put them in the boardroom and let the smell of coffee permeate throughout the office. Now you have to schedule a conference call, integrate different platforms, share content, control a room. It all gets too complicated. That is until you use Crestron to create a seamless hybrid working environment to manage your Teams or Zoom or WebEx meeting environment and focus on your meeting. Visit meetwithcrestron.com forward slash tech talk to take your pain away. And that's all we have time for today, folks. Thanks again, Matt Dickinson, for your excellent research, keeping your ear to the ground about the latest the tech world has to offer. Uh, as people start emerging from their lockdown cocoons, we urge you to stay safe and look after each other. I've been your host. I'm James Eddy. And don't forget to like and, sus- and subscribe. Peace from each other.